France, Russia, England, and the other members of the Entente, the enemies of the Ottoman Empire. Hi, I'm John Baljolo, and welcome to another episode of Ottomans in World War One. In our previous episodes and in our trailer, we had mentioned that we want to talk about the adversaries of the Ottoman Empire as well. We made some mentions of uh, France and England's attempts to get the Ottomans in the war on their side, and how they modernized the Ottoman Empire. We also said that Russia was the eternal enemy of the Ottomans, therefore making it a natural foe in the First World War. Now, in 1815, after the Battle of Waterloo, Europe nearly had relative peace for a hundred years, except the uh, minor conflicts that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. There was not a major war. This is because the European powers had settled down their affairs, mainly thanks to Bismarck's isolation policy of France. He managed to make certain arrangements in order to keep France away. And we'll talk about the French Republic as well. But when you look at the military technology, the Industrial Revolution, the various ideological um, movements coming along, in the years between 1815 and 1914, a lot changed in Europe. Before we go more into the Entente, remember that Germany and Italy had finished their unions, becoming major European powers. Probably the most disadvantageous country to join the First World War on the side of the Entente was France. Once, nearly a century ago, an empire that ruled all of Europe had lost nearly all of its territories. Besides, in 1871, in the Battle of Sedan, the Germans had defeated them. Alsace-Lorraine became a stain on the flag of France, said many nationalists. France had some advantages, though. Well, first of all, they had England as an ally. Uh, which meant that uh, the English Navy would be able to protect the French colonial interests. Second, once it was confirmed that Russia would be on the side of the Entente, then Germany had to fight two enemies. The French Republic was preparing for the war in such a sense that they really didn't change much since the Battle of Sedan. Yes, of course, they had the famous 75mm artillery piece, the most important gun in the war, as you can see in this diagram, but their uniforms looked like as they were still in the last century. The French blue uniforms in the First World War were so, what's the word, anti-camouflage that they actually had to change them. The soldiers kind of looked like they were going to a parade instead of a war. The French, after realizing that they could stop the Germans at the Battle of Mons and ended up getting the British Expeditionary Force, slowly started to realize that they could make other plans. The Sykes-Pico agreement that literally cut the Ottoman lands in half was drafted during the war. France also had one more advantage. She was the defender. Except for certain campaigns in the First World War, she was always on the defense against Germany. Now, as you can imagine, in trench warfare, the defending side has more advantages than the attacking side. We will talk more about the French expeditions in the Anatolian lands in our future episodes. Now, I mentioned that uh, France's advantage was to be with England. Well, England's advantage was a huge naval power. The empire that the sun never sets was very anxious about protecting her dominions. Germany, with its new high seas fleet, threatened British colonies everywhere. Now, of course, Germany finished its unification in a later process, so literally there was nothing on the table for them to get, except Germany, East Africa, and some other places in the East. But England had a lot to worry about. Of course, in the beginning of the war, the British were asking for volunteers to join their forces. The BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, that came to Belgium was not that significant in terms of numbers. But soon, they had to start making mandatory conscription. What the British did was introduce one important weapon into the war that would change military warfare for the next one or two or let's see the future many centuries. The tank. It was first used at the Battle of Somme and it basically changed everything. The British also had another important aspect with regards to the war. 
she was actually defining the strategy that the Entente should follow. We've mentioned about Winston Churchill, the man who created the idea of landing in Gallipoli. It was a brilliant plan, but it was executed in a very bad way, and of course they didn't take one certain individual, Mustafa Kemal, and the heroic Mehmet Chiks under his command. Winston Churchill would continue to be a significant figure during the war and in the Second World War, and we will talk more about this British gentleman in our future episodes. Another important person that the British had was one individual called Lawrence of Arabia, also T. Lawrence. We will talk more about him as well. Now, of course, there was a third member of the Entente, the Russian Kingdom. Now, one should keep in mind that a country with such a large landmass and so many people living in it would be very important for a general war. It was expected that the Russians would not be able to finish their mobilization soon at the outbreak of the war. Now, Russia didn't have any colonial interests, but she had other interests. Making sure that the Slavic countries in the Balkans, Bulgaria and Serbia, were protected was a priority. This was one of the main reasons why the Russians and the Ottomans kept on fighting for such a long time. Also, something that they teach us in school in Turkey, Russia's intention of getting to the warm seas was another aspect. The Dardanelles, Istanbul and Gallipoli, was at the sites of the Russians for centuries. But of course, when the Gallipoli campaign happened, things were not so simple. The Russians wanted to send troops to Gallipoli, maybe even suggesting to land on the northern shores of Istanbul. But the Allies did not want to give the cards to the Russians. But there was one major problem with Russia. Revolution was fuming. It was like a steam engine ready to blow. And we will see that in 1917, that's exactly what's going to happen. The armies of the Russians were at war with the Turks in the First World War more than any other country. Of course, Gallipoli was a major campaign and we had some Arab and uh, British forces in the Palestinian front. And of course, there was Kutul Amara. But the Russians and the Turks fought bitterly over the East. Supplied by their minority friends who wanted to create their own independent nation within the Ottoman lands, they kept attacking the Turks and came as far as Mush and Bitlis, which if you look at the map right now, you'll understand how close they are to the Ottoman mainland. Of course, we're talking about all these countries, right? And, well, their leaders are interesting people. Because, even if you look at their photographs together, you're gonna think, hmm, these guys kind of look alike, don't they? Well, that's exactly the case. A British queen named Victoria, who you can see in this magnanimous picture, is responsible for creating the dynasties of Europe. The King of England, the German Emperor, and the Russian King can be given as main examples. Cousin Nicky used to be the nickname of the Russian Tsar, Nicholas. And it's kind of ironic and sad in a way, when all these countries went to war against each other, it kind of looked like a family feud. But of course, as usual, and as always, the people who suffered the most were the basic soldiers and the basic people. Now, of course, we will talk more in detail about the enemies of the Ottoman Empire in the future. Maybe some of you might got a little bit confused when you saw the caption of this uh, episode. You said, ooh, Ottoman's enemies, Ottoman adversaries, why, uh, why are the Turks at war with everybody? Well, let me give you one hint. If you can look up at a history book, at the Treaty of Sèvres, which is the treaty that ended the Ottoman War in the First World War, you're going to see how the country was partitioned among these, you know, adversaries. Maybe then you will understand why the Ottomans had many enemies. Now, of course, there were two enemies that did not fight against the Ottomans during the First World War. One of them was Italy. Now. There's a nice saying, and I hope my Italian friends will not be offended by this, but they always say Italians make love, not war. Well, in the First World War, it was exactly the case. First, they decided to be neutral, and then when they entered the war, they had some disastrous campaign uh, in the, you know, Isonso Front and in the battles of Caporetto. But in the end, Italy turned out to be one of the victors of the First World War. And... I think Mussolini kind of thought it was stupid that they abandoned 
all their territories in the Mediterranean uh, shoreline of Turkey. Of course, the Turkish independence movement was grateful to the Italians because they left a lot of uh, military equipment for us to use in the war against the Greeks. Now, the Italians were so upset about the result of the First World War, along with Japan, then in the Second World War they said, mm, this time we're going to be on the side that we think is going to win, but will also give us a lot of territories. Another power was, of course, the United States of America. Now, in 1917, when Russia capitulated and signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, everybody thought, uh-oh, the Germans are going to come over and they're going to run us over. Well, I've told you in our previous episodes that the Germans managed to move one and a half million troops from the east to the west in 15 days. Exactly at that time, came to the rescue, as it generally is in world wars, was the US of A. Now, the US was kind of, not secretly, but in a subtle way, supporting England and uh, her ally, France, in the war. They were sending ships, but then you had something that was devised by the Germans, the unlimited submarine warfare. Of course, the sinking of the Lusitania was one of the precursors of the war, and then we had this infamous Zimmerman telegram when the Germans were unsuccessfully trying to convince the uh, Mexicans to attack America once again, and all these provoked the Americans to join the war. Now, this is something interesting. Probably the most advantageous victor of the First World War was the United States of America. This country had suffered a civil war less than a hundred years ago. And after the war, their president with his famous principles, Wilson, they decided that how the world should be regulated after the war. The US and Turkey did not officially fight. I mean, there could have been skirmishes in Europe uh, on various random units. But um, the U.S. would be a pivotal country in Turkey and uh, after the First World War. Now, as you might remember, we promised a special gift for our 1,000th subscriber. Of course, some of you have uh, private accounts, so we cannot see your names, even though you're subscribers. But after some efforts, we found our 1,000th subscriber. Congratulations, Ege Efecik. Tebrik ederiz, as we say in Turkish. Um, please kindly send us an email at ottomansinworldwar1 at gmail.com to claim your prize. Also, please don't forget to follow us on our social media networks, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm your host, John Baljolu, and you've just watched another great episode of Ottomans in World War One.